Hi everybody, I'm Bill Sanders and this is Watch Art Sci, the Art and Science of Watch Collection. Uh, today I'm going to talk about Jacques Hydro. This watch company is, is very interesting on so many levels, <laughs> okay? And what I want to start is, I, I want to start sort of in the middle of it, okay? And this was has to do with a number of watch companies that I call the new millennials. And they they cropped up in the 90s and in the early 2000s. And they, they came from a certain type of watchmaker, with a couple exceptions. And we'll take a look at that. Now you have uh, Beat Haldeman, uh, Frank Mueller, uh, Christopher Claret, uh, Parmigiani uh, Fleurier, which is Michael uh, Parmi, uh, Parmigiani. I have a hard time saying it. I've got one of the watches, but I can't say it. Uh, Andrea Streller, uh, F.P. Jorn, uh, Jacques Droz, Beauvais, 1822. My Beauvais, 1822. <laughs> uh, uh, Kerry uh, Volton Lonnen, uh, Harboring Two, Richard Harboring, and uh, two very talented uh, watchmakers, Rubel and Forsay. Okay, so I mean, there are more than this, by the way, but they, it is a very interesting thing. And they all sort of was crowded between the uh, early 90s and about, it's about the next 15 years, from 1990 to 2005. Now, if we look at uh, Jacques Hedros and we look at Beauvais, all right, so let me take you back to Paris, all right? It was in, oh boy, I think it was the late 90s, early 2000s. My wife, were, my wife and I were in Paris in a department store, and a woman came in. Uh, she was a Chinese woman, and she had this, these wads of money, huge wads of money, all held together with paper clips. The clerks uh, working in the in this big department store were were just they they couldn't take their eyes off her and they were t tittering about the whole thing like oh just look at that woman with all that money. Okay, now the point is was that during this period a lot of people who were making a lot of money in China were coming to Europe and spending that money. And among other people who, who noticed that and, and made a big deal about it and took actions to tap into that were watchmakers. But what they did, they, they bought the name. There wasn't really much of a company to speak of uh, that was Jacques Hydro. Okay. So, uh, I also, at the same time, uh, somebody bought the name Beauvais. And these two companies have a great deal in common. Uh, back in the old days, Beauvais made its start. They were started in England, and they started shipping watches to China, and they were making a fortune. Jacques Hedros started their watchmaking. Well, actually, both of them started elsewhere, but they were, when they really got going, England was the place to be. Watch uh, Jacques Hedros. But the, the, the parallel between these two companies was just amazing. They both had to do with the trade in, in China. In fact, the uh, watches in China uh, were called Beauvais. All right. Um, so let's take a look now at the... Uh, concentrating on Jacques Cadreau, what they were and what uh, where they started. The, the time where they were really making big time money was between 1774 and 1790. And in 1790, it came to a pretty much an abrupt halt. Uh, the reason for that it was that they, there had been the opium wars and all of these other kind of problems largely <laughs> caused by the English. Um, and anyway, 
So the uh, the watch business there went south, and both uh, Beauvais and uh, Jacques Cadreau were out of it. The they started actually uh, Pierre Jacques uh, Jacques Cadreau started back in 1758. And I mentioned the 1774 to 1790 because that was at their at their peak. Okay, now. Just as a tidbit, in 1758, Pierre Jacques Drogue married Marianne Sandoz. Okay, uh, they had two children, Henri Louis, and a daughter, and the wife and daughter both died. Back then, people died a lot <laughs> from different kinds of things. Okay, all right, so. After that, they disappeared, literally. I mean, that was the end of them uh, after 1790. Um, the son of Pierre Jacques, Jacques Hedros, uh, Henri uh, uh, Louis, did carry it on for a while until 1790, and he and another guy were running it then, went broke. Okay, so it disappeared during the entire 19th century. All right, and then in about the second half of the 20th century, it pops up again, Jacques Droz, and it had that funny little arrow with, yeah, it's hard to see, had three tails to it, and that was because a guy, a case maker, a dial maker, and a guy who sold movements got together and said, hey, uh, let's start up a watch company, and there's, uh, we'll call it Jacques Droz because of this famous name that it's associated with. Well, the watches they made were not too memorable, <laughs> all right. Uh, they used a uh, sealed movements, and I think they may have used some other ones, but these were generally, they, they were pretty much bottom of the barrel uh, kind of movements. And when I say bottom of the barrel, they were, they just were cheap. They were cheap movements. They'd throw those in, and they had the... Uh, Jacques Hedroux. By the way, too, it's sort of interesting. Back then, uh, they had the dash, and this is how Jacques Hedroux's name was originally spelled. Modern ones, they took the dash out. Uh, Vacheron Constantin did the same thing. So, yeah, just a bit of, <laughs> of trivia there. Okay, so let's take a look at the modern uh, Jacques Hedroux. Now, this was it was bought by Swatch in 2000. And my, my guess is, and this is pure speculation, nothing more, is that they were they wanted to open up something big in the China trade with China. Now that China was emerging as a, this financial giant, that it's even more so. And so uh, they, they bought them in 2000, and they, 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 they came out with a watch uh, that was called the Gran uh, Segonde. Uh, which means the big second. We'll take a look at that in a, in a minute. By 2010, they had their own manufacturing plant in Crédulot, which was very near the original town that Jacques Cadreau was in. All right? There was no connection otherwise. I mean, they said, well, we'll make it look like there's a connection. Okay. All right. Um, so, all right, so by 2010, now, Nicholas uh, Hayek, who had just done miracles with Swatch and everybody else, he's had sort of this magic touch with that, uh, took over uh, Jacques Cadros in 2009, and in two, I think he died in 2010, all of a sudden, boom, it, he had got it, he had this great big manufacturing plant and so forth. Now, one of the things a lot of people think, oh, well, you know, I bet uh, since they're SWATs, they had ETA movements. I got to tell you, <laughs> they don't, all right? And that would be the last thing on earth that SWATs would want, okay? Because they want this, they want to have a high horology watch. They want to have something that they can charge a lot of money for. And if word got out they were using ETAs or something else that they owned, that would be bad. So they they were, of all of the people who didn't want an inexpensive movement, 
It was Swatch, all right, one of their own. Okay, so let's see what happened with them. Now, around 2002, they came out with the uh, Grand Segonde. And this one is has a figure eight. I, I thought it looked like a snowman, but it's, it's an eight. <laughs> all right, a figure eight watch. And apparently eight is a lucky number in China, like seven is in the West, or with people like me who are superstitious about those things. Okay, so this was a this was something that okay they were they had thought this through and they had used some of the old ideas from some of the earlier Jacques Hedros, and he did have some with the Grand Seconde, so or the Grand yeah the Grand Seconde. All right, so now at the time they were using Frederick Piguet caliber. So when they first got started, now Frederick Piguet, as you probably know, I think around 2010, that was bought by uh, Swatch, and then they became part of Blanc Pain, and they became Blanc Pain manufacturer. Okay, Frederick Piguet's movements were made and used by a lot of people. Okay on the high end. This was considered a high end movement. All right. Still is. All right. So now at the same time, the, um, Jacques Quedreau had set up these, these codes. Okay. He had eight of them. And so what I, what I thought I'd do is that we could best understand the, the sense of Jacques Quedreau today based on this, the codes they have. The codes in a way are, are sort of a type of business plan in a very large strategic sense or a business plan. And the first one was <laughs> this figure eight dial that they had. Now, the second one was what they called automata. And this is where they have the, they have this one called charming bird and a bird runs around and does something. This is another, this is a bird repeater Geneva. And the egg will crack and the other birdies will go, they'll do something. But it, it's some kind of automatic movement. These apparently were more popular in China and that was their, that was their primary uh, customer audience. Uh, the third code was what they called the Atelier d'Art. And this had to do with some artwork on the dial. I mean, rather than just something plain, they were going to put something on there. Uh, here's an example of a painting called the Petit Oeuvre Our Minute Carps, okay? Uh, which meant a little uh, hour and minute. And the carps were the fish. <laughs> uh, that thing is decorated with diamonds all around it. That's really a uh, I mean, they have a lot of these. And if you look at the old ones back that we looked at initially that they were selling to China, they had a lot of this kind of thing in it. So this was, this was something that, even though there was no direct link between uh, Jacques Hedros and the modern company, they used a lot of the, uh, the old one for direction. Okay, uh, the fourth is called Grand Fu Enameling. This is where it's fired up and you basically have fired enamel that's right on, on, the, uh, on the watch's dial. And they make some very, very beautiful watches. Uh, this is an example of the Grand Segonde Peloni. Okay, uh, the next is the watch cases. Um, here the focus is, is that in my own mind, when I saw, okay, this is a code, a code for one of the, one of the eight codes, this probably means they're, they're not going to be really knocking themselves out on movements. But there was a hesitation in my head. I'm saying, wait a minute, they're making these automata. So there's got to be s some more attention. Uh, to movement. So, so we'll see about that later. Okay. All right. So here's some examples of the cases. There's uh, one is, there are a couple of examples that Onyx and uh, this, the smaller one has the eight with the diamonds. Uh, that's a lady eight. Another one you can see on the case has all of this engraving. 
and uh, then up in the corner you can have another one. It looks like a fan. The rotor is in the shape of a fan. Now I know the rotor is part of the movement, but it's also part of the case in the sense that it, it gives you what you're looking at. Okay, so watch cases was another big part of that. The sixth one was exceptional uh, mechanisms. Now, having heard they got start. They started their first movements with Frederick Piguet, knowing that Frederick Piguet went over to became part of Blanc Pain. I just assumed, hmm, eh, but they're probably using their Blanc Pain movements. Well, maybe not. <laughs> I mean, they are, uh, the movement names are all uh, Jacques Droz. And the more I thought about it, the more I looked at it, I said, well, here they're making the automata. And I saw this one, the Lady Eight Flower. Uh, this is a gold one there. Look at that. They've got like a two-story movement. This this is, <laughs> whoa, I have not seen anything like that before. And it's also not limited to time only. The uh, 12 cities up in the upper right up there is a uh, world traveler, and you have, a, you have a pusher there that you can set it to 12 different cities. <laughs> one of them is Geneva. Probably would be Beijing and New York and Mumbai and some of the other London major cities in the world. Uh, at the bottom, there's a chronograph. And again, a chronograph is another type of movement that is something that is not one of these things. It's a time-only movement. All right, so exceptional movements, that's is one of their, their goals. And with that new factory that they have, it looks like they're doing something with it. Okay, uh, minerals. This is a they like to use uh, different kind of minerals in their uh, in their dials. You can see this one is a sunstone uh, part of their, and then the, you know the same the same style will have paintings or enamel or one of this, one thing or the other. Minerals they felt that was an important part to include, and finally they have this thing called. Numerous uh, causes. I thought it was calculus. <laughs> again, this is using their number eight again. And they have additions are limited to one, eight, 28, and 88. Uh, that one picture is the uh, Grand Segundi Minute repeater. They only made uh, 28 pieces of that, a limited edition. I think they had it in different colored um, uh, dials. And so... It was really more than that, but still, that's a. I mean, even uh, 88 pieces of something, a fairly limited edition. Okay, um, so that's to me, is, uh, Jacques Hedro is a very, very interesting uh company. Uh, they seem to be pretty high horology as far as I can determine. I, it would be very difficult for them not to be, especially with the automata that they use, or that they that they uh, that they make. So it it's one of these companies too that uh, at least here in the West we ignore them a, a great deal. And again, with the I'm not sure where that crackdown in China is right now. I know that certain things may have loosened up with trade agreements and whatnot. But it's a really interesting kind of thing. Also, too, uh, with that new millennial group I was talking about at the beginning, um, one of the things that was interesting, uh, uh, here's my Parmigiani. I didn't realize that Terry Walton Lonnen also worked there for a while uh, doing restorations. This is one of the things that you find about a lot of our great contemporary watchmakers, they all worked at some time with restorations of all of these classics. So that's another thing I thought was interesting. But one of the most interesting things was that Jacques Cadreau's married Marianne Santos. And it's the Santos Foundation, family foundation, that uh, sponsors <laughs> Parmigiani. Talk about a interesting system. <laughs> Okay, well, listen, uh, I'd love to hear what you, what you think about um, Jacques Droz. If you have one, I'd like to hear what you, what you think about it. And um, 
this is an invitation to subscribe. And on Sunday, what we're going to have, uh, going to the, uh, what's called the, the Watch Time Show in New York City. It's going to be uh, later today, Friday. And then I'll have a report back uh, on Sunday and talk about uh, anything new or interesting uh, that happened at the show. Hope to see you Sunday. Bill Sanders for Watch Outside, the art and science of Watch Collection.